It's going to be a host, or I can just start. Um, I don't know. Can we just get started? No, we can. Okay. You want this? Sure. Okay. Hello? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I think it's about time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start my seminar. First of all, I feel very, uh, very privileged to have a chance to share my research finding. Well, currently, uh, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Daniel Ling. And I'm currently working in Sweden, uh, Department of Health Sciences, Karlstad University. And uh, so uh, over the summer, I'm doing the uh, visiting scholarship with uh, Dr. Chuang at the Department of Psychiatry. And uh, my background is a combination of psychiatry and also the genetic epidemiology. So as uh, a clinician, I, I think I deeply understand that the, the one of the biggest challenges in psychiatry is probably the uh, heterogeneity clinical heterogeneity or that lead to many different problems like patients are different. And so a lot of a great proportion of my research effort is um, to figure out that what might be uh, you know, a different way to look at the, uh, to understand the causes and the consequences of clinical heterogeneity. And that's part of the reason that I got into the research on the aggression, be aggression behavior and violence because this is a a very heterogeneous behavior, and it can we can see that across many different diagnoses. And we were wondering that well, if we have different level of aggression, refer to different level of biological factors or different level of environmental exposure. So it's a very fascinating area, but also very important. And it's important because I think I believe that most people uh, understand that violence, aggression, behavior has a great impact and public health, as well as the individual health, even the family, uh, etc. And according to uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, this is the first leading cause of death in the younger generation. So the, the number of mortality is almost around 200,000 each year. And I believe that this number came from maybe the data published four or five years ago, and I believe that the number might be higher uh, recently. So, well, as I said in the beginning that the problem with uh, behavior, human behavior, is heterogeneity, a different, different aspect of uh, any particular type of behavior. So is aggression or violence behavior. So I put down three pictures here to show that V are three different types of behavior. Uh, and I think they share the common feature, common theme, which is the aggression. And the first one is the Me Too uh, movement. I guess you probably heard about that. It's very uh, 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 important social movement in recent probably uh, five years. And the second one is the mass shooting. Then this picture was taken from the, I think it was probably two years ago, one year ago, I forgot about that. It's the mass shooting in Las Vegas, the probably highest mortality rate in the history of the United States. And the last one is the bullying, victimization in the campus. Well, some people think that this is my minor form of aggression, but the impact might not be smaller than the other types of aggression behavior. So there are so many different types of behavior. And it will be a kind of a, give us some kind of a, you know, challenge to think about that. So where do we start? So when we start to try to understand the causes, the risk factor for behavior, we need to understand that what might be the possible pathway, right? And so one of the hypotheses is that it all comes that it, it is a chain of reaction. And every, everybody just needs something happen in the end to snap. So the chain of reaction kind of based on the assumption that the behavior starts with something like usually start from, you know, like back to the, the original biological basis of the gene. And then the gene leads to the functionality of our body system and for behavior primarily is the brain. So the brain function will be considered as a primary physiological process, right? So we need to measure that. It will be important, the first layer of physiological process responsible for behavior, for violent behavior, aggressive behavior. And then we can talk about the environment of the trigger, right? You have the kind of a functionality as a basis, but we also need some other thing to exacerbate to make the thing worse. One of that, for example, is the like stressful event, environmental trigger. And then 
the second day field without process will come in play, like even you are like the, the brain is on fire, like the inflammatory process is going on and you got a stress in the, in the system. But if you have good impulse control, the behavior might be able to be uh, to be stopped. So that will become like a second layer, like a gatekeeper, or like a second hit hypothesis. Like this, this thing need also be, be in pair in order to lead to the final negative outcome. But some people think that this is not always the case. It's not always a chain reaction. We should look, look at the whole process. It's like just like when we look at the behavior. It's always a matrix, a matrix of different domain of the. Uh, uh, you know, contributing factors. And so uh, many psychiatrists or the uh, community medicine clinician like to use the model called biopsychosocial model to explain the development of different types of diseases. So you try to apply the kind of uh, theoretical framework to the aggressive behavior. We can simply divide it into like the similar the three axes, right? And so in biological, we can look at the gene neural circuits, and even gut microbiome, etc., that all together influence our behavior. But for the psychological axis, we will have different type of measurement, but you can say that these two things tied with each other. So we can measure the cognition, violence, impulsivity, etc., etc., to understand that what are the contributing factors, psychological factors for aggressive behavior, right? And then the third axis is social. There are several different things that sociologists or social medicine researchers like to use, such as social economic status, etc., etc. And so, what we need to understand is that when we look at these different kind of axis of uh, measurement that measure different level of the risk factor, like for genetic factor or psychological factor, we usually focus on individual level. You can measure the individual level, like the what is the gene expression, what is the, the brain activation level, et cetera, right? But when you measure a social axis, uh, researchers tend to look at from a broader scale, like what is the impact of a social economic status in this area compared to the other one? So you can see that but th this might be a problem when you try to connect the dots uh, by telling a coherent story across different axes. So my plan then trying to, I try to divide into three parts based on my three uh, recent publication. And so the first one is biological aspect. So as we mentioned earlier that uh, when we talk about biological aspect of the violent behavior, we, we think about this gene and the neural circuit, et cetera, right? So here this pilot study, I call it pilot study because this is the uh, uh, sample size based on only, on, only 15 uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, bipolar disorder. And what we try to achieve, what we try to clarify to figure out is that so what leads from the, the biological basis down the road to the outcome behavior, right? And so, but again, but, but apparently there are a lot of things going on between these two, the, the, the starting point and the end point. So what we need to kind of try to narrow the least of the player in the pathway. So we, we think that brand activation still remain the central, the key actor in this pathway. So some kind of act brain activation will increase, correspond to the level of aggressive behavior, right? But what come before the brain activation is genetic factors. So we'll be, we, so that's why we measure the genetic coding variants using the next generation sequencing and also the, using the RNA sequencing to look at gene expression level. And as you know that the DNA template theoretically will influence how much a gene it expects, right? And how much the gene is expect is supposed to influence the physiological consequences, such as the, you know, the, how much the brain area, the activation is, has, can be observed. And by doing that, but another problem is the, another challenge with neuroimaging research for behavior is that we need to understand that our brain constantly changed in response to the environment, right? That uh, even you measure the same person, different time point, doing different tasks, the brain activation will be different. So we need to kind of like have a consensus up uh, regarding that. So what might be the task that can be used to standardize the activation? And so we choose the non-frustrative, non-reward 
as a domain of the construct to just try to try to figure out that that might be the brand activation more closely associated with the violent behavior. And I want to, I'm going to explain what that is in the later slide. And so simultaneously, we need to measure that. So whether the brain activations leading to aggressions through other factors, and these are some other psychological factors we can measure, such as emotional uh, emotional arousal, for example. So the study is done like that. We need to we collect, we recruit a couple of adolescents with the same diagnosis, try to reduce the problem of the heterogeneity due to diagnosis. And then we will assess their risk of uh, aggressive behavior using questionnaire. So it's basically it's asking about the, what happened in the past six months that include uh, how they react to the stressful event, and also that we'll take the into consideration about their prior psychiatric hospitalization into account. So, to, so, so that then we, we can we'll be able to compose a score for each person, that each score will present the level of aggressive behavior. And then we use a functional MRI and MRIs to measure the, the brain activation and the uh, approximate level of the neurotransmitter with a focus on glutamate. And then we, you know, as we showed or we seen the previous slide, we're going to use a DNA material and all material to understand the coding variance, the quantum value coding variance and the gene expression level. So the first part of the of this, of the project is that we see that if we look at, if we, the task is viewing the unpresent images, we try to use that unpresent image to, to sort of to understand that compared to the control of the neutral images, right? And then what brain activation may be detected after the task. Everybody viewing the, the same type of images. And we found that when they reviewing the unpresent images that for the left side, this functional MR we see that the two region, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingular gyrus, these two regions are more activated in patients with higher level uh, manic symptom. So here we are not looking at the aggressive behavior, we use another proxy, many manic symptoms. And the right hand side, this is uh, using the MRS to obtain a proxy, a proxy of the glutamate level. And so we see again that for those two regions, the glutamine, glutamine level was at least marginally significant associated with the, the level of the, of the manic symptom score. So this is a layer of foundation in terms of like these two regions might be of interest, right? And then uh, the neurotransmitters such as glutamine might play a role. But of course, we need more evidence. So the next step we're going to do, what we did is that we we try to use the memory war, the frustrating memory war as a task to, 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 to see what they respond. And so this psychological domain is a little bit closer to the, 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 the idea about the aggression behavior, right? Like, you know, if you experience some kind of frustration, the kind of the emotional responses and the correlated psychological responses, we kind of assume that they might be similar or correlated with the aggressive behavior. So personal task was originally designed to measure attention, right? You give the, uh, the subject, uh, you know, uh, like a very simple comp computer game and ask them to follow the rule. And if that did the task uh, successfully, they will receive the feedback, like, you know, did a good job or you did it wrong, do it again. So we divided the, the, the task into three, three, three parts. The first part requires sincere feedback. It's a true feedback. If they did it correctly, they get a thumbs up. Or if they did it incorrectly, they, 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 they receive a thumbs down. And the second part is try to use a monetary feedback to see whether that kind of a, you know, different in terms of the, just the, the pure feedback. And the third part actually is the key part because we try to use the second, third part to arouse, to elicit the uh, non-reward, the frustrated non-reward uh, responses. So in other words, that when they did it correctly, we told them that they are wrong, on, you know, on purpose. And so we call it the, the written feedback. So how do we know these tasks work? So we use a nonverbal assessment it's a, uh, to uh, assess their 
three psychological constructs. The first one is balance, second one is uh, activation, and the third one is control. And so we try to avoid the, uh, the language perception issue, so to ask the, the subject to point to the mannequin that most represent what, how they feel after the rigged feedback, after the, the task. And so we'll be able to measure that, whether they have positive balance, truly happy, or on the other hand, very unhappy. And this is the, the second one is the activation. It's more about arousal, arousability. So if they choose this one, they feel really excited, or on the other hand, very, very calm. And the third one is control. How they feel about to have control over the current situation. And so, again, they have to choose the mannequin to represent that. So then we will be able to measure that before the task. And after the task, do we see any difference? Because if there was no difference, we might be, it might be speculated to say that maybe this task, this frustrating money work didn't really work out, right? Because their emotions pretty much stay the same. So we found that for the arousal, and the, for, for the balance and for the dominance, the three axes like read feedback usually will trigger more higher level of arousal. A few more arousal, like for the second type of mannequin. And for the moon, the moon going down, the lower stage is always, again, is the read feedback. And the dominance, like again, the, the third type, the, uh, the, the read feedback corresponds to the lower level of the the sense of self-control. So this kind of confirmed that, well, maybe this test uh, was useful, right? It was useful in terms of to uh, kind of like the meaning, how they experience in real life when they receive the frustrated memory war. And so then we got to the, move to the, the, the stage of to measure their biological substrate, right? And of course, I mean, you can see that, you know, what we did is that we got it from the peripheral blood cell. And uh, this is brain situation, so maybe the peripheral blood cell, uh, blood cell did not really reflect what's, what's going on in the brains, in the gene, in the in neuron. And according to the previous research, it said only probably 40% at most of the gene, in terms of the gene expression level, correlated between our blood cell and the brain. But we just to be as what we have. And so we use the peripheral blood cell to, to, to measure that, the two things, right? The first thing is that the number of rare coding variants, and the reason is because we try to, because the sample size was small, we try to just target the genetic variant that have larger effect size, which is usually the rare variants and coding variants. And so we count the number of the, of the coding variants in some pathway. And this slide showed that this is from a pathway associated with the pro-inflammatory responses centered on uh, tumor necrosis factor. We did, a, of course, we did a whole genome uh, sequencing, but uh, part of the reason we focused on the pro-inflammatory hypothesis was because that we have another study, ongoing study, we're trying to look at whether the anti-inflammatory medication can reduce the uh, emotional arousal in, in this uh, adolescence. And so we found that, yeah, there seems to be, a, again, this code, it's p-value actually, it's not very far away from 0.05. Um, but we, are, we see that well, if, you have, if the person has more coding mutation rare variants, which is like bigger from the, the normal population, that the level of the, again, another measurement to measure the emotional arousal, there was a positive correlation. And similarly, we measure the, uh, the gene structure level with the full change Again, there was a positive correlation. So it seems that, it, well, at least the pro inflammatory pathway might be one of the players, but we don't know because, like I said, this is the uh, this is a cross section study and, the, and also the, this is a pilot study. So we don't know whether these genetic changes occur because of the because of the task. Because again, we we also did not know that. How long it will take? Like if you if you receive the stress, the acute stress, how long does it take for your gene to activate to fire more for those pro-inflammatory gene? So this could actually just represent the precondition genetic genetic uh, functionality. So it, 
Another, maybe more acceptable explanation is that this is the baseline genetic profile associated with the, uh, the uh, uh, pro-inflammatory genetic pathway. Maybe I missed it, but those genes, when they are overexpressed, they are leading to more TNF-alpha. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, but they might not be the top finding, but we just focus on those pathways. And then for the for the the, the functional MRI uh, study, we found that the this region, a uh, medial orbital prefrontal cortex, was associated. The activation was associated with the with this different thing. In addition to what we just said, right, genetic variant, also the arousal level, and also the aggression score. And so we tried to figure out that whether we can connect all this stuff together. But because of the sample size, so we, uh, we try to connect all these different dots, you know, using the another method you can use as a structural equation model to put everything together. And we are trying to use a machine learning algorithm to figure out whether we can use this factor to predict that. But for the using the more traditional method, we'll be able to see, can we take this causal pathway from DNA to RNA and then to the brain elevation and then to the outcome? And it, so that might be the idea way to do that. But here, again, as you we're trying to see that, well, at least this gene expression not only associated with the emotional arousal, as I presented earlier, but also they're associated with these two major regions, amygdala and the uh, anterior single gyrus, that the, uh, the, it seems that there's most of the, this association is the positive one. More expression, more activation, and remember, this is our the case with the same diagnosis, and they are just, uh, uh, they went through the same task to release the frustrating experience. And so, I would say that these two regions might represent, oh, sorry, these two things here. Like we found the anterior single gyrus and amygdala, right? And so, uh, according to this, this review article, they, uh, the amygdala, we can say that it's more associated with, the, in terms of emotional regulation, it might be more associated uh, uh, with, with the uh, emotional identification. And then for the anterior single gyrus right here, it might be associated with the more emotion, uh, voluntary emotional regulation. Like when I feel kind of a, like, a, you know, stressed out, angry, and want to calm myself down, the kind of voluntary uh, competency to, 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 to do that. But again, the reason I'm showing these slides that there, when we talk about the emotional arousal, or arousability, how to regulate that, actually, all these, these different components might be associated with that, and it depends upon how we measure the emotional regulation to understand that, yeah, maybe they, they, each one is a, is a team player, but they might respond for different aspects of emotional arousal. So that's kind of like a snapshot of the biological aspect, how I use the biological aspect to understand some of these factors associated with uh, that violent or aggressive behavior. But what about psychological aspect? So we, Inspired by some other pilot study, we think that maybe we need to figure out that uh, more, a more objective way to measure something as a biomarker or predictor for the, the risk of aggression, right? And so we decided to use the eye tracking scan to see whether, like, you know, how people view the images without receiving any instruction can reveal or can be used to predict the, the level of the uh, aggra aggressive tendencies. So again, then we, 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 we chose a, a, a hypothesis that the, the key psychological domain for this type of behavior is how a person pro receives and process the social information. So uh, there is a term called uh, hostility attrition bias, which means that if a person tends to it interpret other person's intention as more hostile, the person might be more likely to commit uh, aggressive behavior. Like if you're driving on a highway, and someone kind of lying, and how, how likely do you think that person is not trying to piss me off? They kind of tend to can be used to predict the level of the aggressive behavior according to some prior research. So here we try to see that, can we quantify or objectively measure this, how a person process the social information? So. We can see that, we, we, we can definitely can, can, def, can classify that the social and memory process process is not just a one processor, it's actually involved many, it's three, at least three or even more steps, right? How do we see? 
like sometimes your attention or your cognition might, might influence how we choose to pay attention to some subjects. And then how we encode the, so the information is more like how we interpret it, right? And finally, how we uh, output those uh, uh, the, 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 the emotional uh, result, right? And all of these theoretically can be measured by visual attention. We put the person in front of the computer, and that person view the images randomly, and we will be able to collect their visual attention towards a subject with our embedded social meaning. So what we do is that we uh, ask them to view a series of pictures. And this picture, we divide into two types of picture. The first type of picture is that it's two-person interaction. A two-person, they're arguing with each other, or a person is looking away, and the other person is like looking at the person with frowning face. It's one type, the first type of picture. And the second type of picture is just the facial expression. It's the very commonly used, like facial, human facial expression, how do we view them? And that we can have kind of have a, a, a range of different level of uh, violence, like very neutral, ambiguously, uh, you know, angry and very angry, different type of picture. And then we will be able to, you know, as you see in this slide, we'll be able to measure their, oops, how much time their eye gaze spin on the particular region of the picture. And so we, using the software, we'll be able to generate a heat map, right? The, in the red, indicate I spend most time. And then the yellow is kind of second, and then the green. And the other region is that it, it doesn't mean that they, don't, they do not look at those regions. It's more, it's to represent that uh, those regions, are, they, they, they spend insufficient time of that, so we can ignore that. So we try to capture only the eye gaze fixation time point, which means that it's meaningful attention. If you are interested in something, Yes, so you supposedly you will look at that as an object a little bit longer than just you know, randomly browsing through this, like this podium, like you know, look at the, the, the audience, supposedly more uh, longer time. And, but in terms of the fixation time, we can also measure the eye gaze dispersion, like not just how, how long they view a particular face, but also like, how their eye gaze move around. So from using the Spatial statistical technique, we could be able to understand that whether those eye gaze point, whether they are clustered, even though they spend more time, the same time, but sometimes, like these two person, they might spend the same time. Each dot, number of dots represent uh, each eye gaze fixation point. So based on the, how, how we set up the default of the, of the program, we can, we can you know, set up each, like maybe each one is represent 0.01 uh, seconds, for example. But you might argue that these two pictures represent different things, even though they have same fixation time. And what do I mean by that? The right side, actually, this person seems to be have more dispersed, more scattered eye gaze fixation points. So as you can see, that it's going on there. So actually, the interest level might be lower than the other one that is always moving around in the center point of the region. And but we need to figure out how to quantify that, right? So basically, that. Uh, each region, like when we set a region, uh, like, like maybe around the eye, uh, around the eye region, so we set a center point, so we'll be able to measure the, the many, many different eye gaze points, as I see in the previous slide, the orange point, right? And so we can compare that, well, this is the early time point, and then the next one, if the distance is increasing, then it sounds like, it looks like actually attention is being di dispersed. And what do we mean by it's been being dispersed? Actually, it could mean different thing. Maybe uh, the person feel scared, or you know, repulsed, or other thing, or maybe has attention just 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 because of attention pro uh, issues. So, but we can divide into like, a version. At the first one, if the uh, if 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 the second is later point, the distance becoming larger and larger. In other country, if the the distance is actually at least maintain the same as the earliest time point, we can assume that the person actually is kind of engaged in trick, right? And finally, we can measure the speed of this travel distance. Like this distance will be measured by like the distance divided by the time as a default time interval in our program. A longer and different and shorter will refer to different thing. So we can combine three things to construct our, you know, in terms of how scattered these points are. Uh, 
if the result, I'm trying to summarize briefly, is that the result, like dispersion, it didn't work out so well. We didn't see any great uh, uh, significant differences. But for the ice gaze fixation time, we, we observed two interesting findings. So this is the first type of images I mentioned earlier. Right? This is our interaction. We see the images, two characters. So we will be able to kind of deliver this as a, as to me the social information. When you observe a two-person interacting with each, each other, what kind of attention you will pay to the uh, the characters and also the region of the of the images. So this is the left panel represents just one of the from one of the, of the object. Like if the vision score is lower, then then the attention, video attention, is focused on the facial area of these two characters. If we can divide two characters, like this is like a victim, potential victim, like this is a you know, situation of the uh, bullying victimization, this is a victim, and this is a perpetrator, or this is a bully. And without that, like, if the person doesn't have a really high aggression score, this is what, this is what they are looking at uh, through, the, through the whole process. And if this person has a higher level of aggression score, we found that the, uh, the, 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 the pattern are different from the previous one. But it looked like that this person, high grade aggression score person, tried to avoid the facial region, the eye contact region. Similarly, the second type of images that right, we provide the, the, the subject with the series of facial expression. And we found that this is what low aggression score individual did, like still spending most of the time to viewing the eye region. And but for a person with a high aggression score, without that, it's kind of like try to avoid this eye contact again if the person have higher aggression score in this kind of situation. But again we have a many different type of images here. So we still need kind of a, like we have a further clarification, not just the two things, but not just the uh, interaction and facial expression. If in the facial, in the interaction part, we try to combine, we try to divide it into two parts, confrontational and non-confrontational. So what do I mean by that? Like this will be defined as non-confrontational because these two persons, they are not looking at each other, even though there's a tension between them, right? But if these two persons, they are like facing each other, look at they're arguing that it will be defined as uh, confrontational. So we found that for the confrontational part, these differences in fixation time was not significant with the level of aggression. Only for the non-confrontational type, like the bullying is like victimization in the picture that I just show, like that kind of picture where we will be able to distinguish the individual between the high aggression risk and the low aggression risk. And for the facial expression part is that if the facial expression is neutral or ambiguous in terms of the facial coding, but again, we didn't see very uh, as big difference in terms of the fixation time, the visual attention. But if we use the angry faces, like the, like the emotional coding is, is easier to like, this is like angry face, then we will be able to observe like the higher aggression risk individual will tend to not look at the, the eye region, but on the other hand, but try to shy away from the eye, the, the eye region. And so we try to use our data to support that in terms of whether we kind of ambiguous the information is an indicator for aggression score. Now this is, again, this is just a work in progress. We try to see that. We can, make, we can use a questionnaire to ask, per, ask the person that, how likely you can tolerate ambiguity? Like, do you like to live in another country? Would you indicate that there are more uncertainty? Or do you like the same routine? Or do you like that your, uh, your teacher give you kind of an assignment without clear instruction? So this kind of ambiguity can be divided into two parts, right? The first one is like complexity. How likely are you to tolerate complexity? And the second type is the unpredictability. Like, you know, when we do another foreign country, it might not be a complex situation, but you can say it's more toward the, 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 the spectrum of the, the how predictable the situation can be. And we found that we divided in two parts, we found that for the tolerance to complexity, if you have higher level to tolerate complexity, 
that you actually you might have a lower level of aggression score. And on the other hand, if you have a higher level of tolerance to unpredictability, you might have a higher aggression score. And so this result kind of a partially lend the support to the previous slide showing that when the situation is ambigu ambiguous, then the more aggressive uh, individual they do they they, they, they will not see, you know exhibit or the, the show that uh, a very different visual attention because they can tolerate the ambiguity uh, in that regard. But again, that we may have, could probably have another more sophisticated task to understand that how do we use the image to carry the deliver this complexity and unpredictability. I think maybe I will think that maybe a video might be a better way to go for the, uh, the follow up study. So again, there's uh, the, the, the second part about the psychological uh, aspect of aggression behavior. And so the, the final part of the social aspect, we kind of shift the gear because now we're going to move to uh, try to use it. Like, can we use the social population level data to, to, to identify some risk factor for aggression behavior? And it was, as you know, there previously uh, there were a lot of research uh, to look at like uh, what is the social economic status influencing the, the homicide rate or the uh, uh, the incarnation rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here we try to focus on a very specific type of violent behavior, mass shooting. And so the, the, we, were, we, we were inspired by the earlier study to look at the time train of homicide. So we want to know that what about the time train of mass shooting? Right. The first question is that is the mass shooting becoming really becoming more frequent than before? And the second question is that can we predict uh, whether you know in terms of timing when they are going when is there going to be next uh, tragedy something like that? So here I'm trying to you know use another kind of like a data data uh, mining technique to understand that when we look at the uh, the report from uh, WHO to find a keyword, we found that there are some keywords with uh, correlation correlated with each other more frequently than the other uh, the pair of, uh, of the keywords. So I uh, have the essential thing is the learning thing here, and of course there are other variables here. And that's why when we try to look at the risk factor of the time train of mass shooting, we will try to identify some measurement that can represent how we can learn this kind of behavior and we do the use of the media. Again, it's just an assumption because I, I don't think there is a very clear, uh, you know, uh, approximation idea. If you watch more, you know, like uh, video game uh, with some violent content, then you you learn that it's just an approximation. But this is what we know, right? It seems like the, at least this year seems to be very uh, uh, tragic year. Like uh, it's the first time that since 2016, at least one incident per day. And this is so. This is what we know, and we also know that no no predictor for incidence rate. And then we also are not so confident in terms of what is the role of the some other, you know, regulation uh, protective factor, and also the mental health issue is also another unknown to, uh, area. And so we start with looking at the time train. So time trains define like we can look at it, we can extract the data for the past three decades, and then we can calculate that the what is the time interval between two consecutive incidents, right? Is it one month? Is it two months? Is it just uh, uh, three days, etc. And so, and then we can this is interval, this is y axis, and then for the x axis we'll be able to look at the calendar, the calendar year, and then to calculate that whether this declining was so this was significant. We used the zero inflated Poisson regression model to to model that, and not surprisingly, we try to model the variable like the gun ownership, and mental illness level, and the uh, poverty level. But again, I would think that most of these variables have a lot of problems because, for example, the gun ownership, it was hard to really calculate the real number, uh, the, the 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 rate of gun ownership because. After 2012 or 13, the CDC stopped publishing the real number of gun ownership. So we took the advice from the reviewer that we used a different proxy. We used a number that 
uh, uh, the firearm related suicide divided by all suicide as a proxy number to 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 in, to infer that that might be that might represent the gun ownership in each area. And here we use state level data, so we look at the state level uh, gun ownership, and also the same thing mental illness rate and other uh, like public rate, etc. And so we found that only the time the calendar year can predict that incidence rate, that consecutive, between consecutive incidence, incidence rate, but the other variable was, were not found to be significant. But like I said, like, I, mean, I think that we might need to kind of think about that, what might be a better way to measure those variables. It doesn't mean that those variables didn't contribute to the increasing incidence rate, to my, in my opinion. <laughs> and so, we just mentioned that the learning might be a key word in the violence, right? And so one of the, uh, the examples we learned from the other violence research is the snowball effect, right? Like, uh, for example, in terms of suicide, that if, uh, if there's a suicide case in, in, in the school, that, well, usually that the report of the suicidality in the same school district will be increased based on prior, uh, previous uh, observation. And some researchers think that it is because of through the snowball effect. It's hard to say that when people try to learn the behavior by observing the peer, or it's just because of some other unknown connection. So we are proposing hypotheses that this snowball effect or contagious effect was triggered by the exposure to media. So we are thinking that maybe it might be reasonable to say that if there was a new incident and then we trigger or there will not we will trigger some other media coverage right so we will be measured that how many how many uh, like an online report have been published but after that incident and before the next incident right and again we can also that uh, measure that how frequently the online user try to you know search the information with the keyword mass shooting, for example. And then we will be able to measure that whether these two, these two measurements can predict the interval of next two events. So the media coverage is that we can, you know, we can use the uh, this Google searching engine to, 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 to see that how frequently that person, uh, what you use this keyword, that how frequent the report using the keyword had been published between any uh, period of time and we are focusing on the subsequent to see that whether that number can predict the, the subsequent between incident duration, as I said. If you, if you predict shorter and shorter, that, that indicate that the media coverage kind of a, a play a role in terms of increasing incidence rate of mass shooting. The second measurement that we can do is using, again, using the Google Trend or another uh, uh, data archive to, to, to quantify what is the level of searches using a particular keyword in particular region in particular period of time? So we'll be able to quantify the, uh, the media usage. Of course, with the focus on the online report, we, uh, this, kind of, this kind of queries kind of exclude the other like TV or reading magazine, et cetera. But we kind of assume that maybe these online media coverage will represent a majority of the, or the, the portal of the media. And so, so uh, our report found that, well, these two, the left panel is the, how frequent uh, online report is published between, in that, in that duration, use that to predict the next one. We found that there is a negative correlation, which means that the more, an online report has been published online where it seems to predict that the next event will come sooner. So there is a trend that's showing that the interval is getting smaller and smaller. And again, you can argue that, well, maybe it's not, not because of that, it's just because of calendar year, right? It's a, it's a, it's a temporal trend because this thing is, we know that it's, go, it's going to happen, uh, it's, it's increasing. So no matter, you, can, you cannot just try to throw in any variable to, to see that. Well, that might be the reason to explain that the mass shooting has been increasing, it's been on the rise. So we, at least we try to use the calendar year as a control variable, but this might not be the proper way to control for that. So even after controlling for the calendar year, we can still see that there is a correlation 
And the same thing goes with the online search level entries, which means that in this period of time, right after this incident, we found that very dish. There's a greater peak of search interest compared to the like then the other duration that we might be, you know, have to be careful that maybe the next incident might also be uh maybe you know in, in somewhere in, in in the country as well. So that so we found these two observations. But I think the challenge is the interpretation. What does it really mean, right? So that's uh, we we haven't we haven't tried to uh, collect the, the data in a different way, but I, that's our next, next, next step to understand that. So what do we mean by like, the media usage is, is associated with the increasing incidence rate? So uh, using this uh, 15 minutes, I'm trying to present these three different types of projects. And, and then I think one of the reasons because, you know, I, my training is more about data sciences, so usually I'm trying to uh, help other projects to uh, to try to use a different statistical model to understand, to tell the story. But, but there's actually a hidden coherent theme around these three components, right? We found a little biological part that emotion regulation might be the key construct we should measure. And then the pro-inflammatory gene might be associated with that. So the next thing we need to do is that, can we use that? pro-inflammatory regime to leverage the information from the psychological and even the social, like the, the media exposures research. Well, for example, like, will increased level of uh, exposure to media associated with mass shooting or violence associated with the pro-inflammatory uh, gene uh, activation. That is the one type of the thing that we can do for the next step. And for a psychological step, that social information processing is biased. We found that Social learning processing by the visual attention might be used to predict the aggression level. So I think it will be intuitive to think that, well, how that is, we can uh, maybe combine these two construct that we combine the how they view visual attention in terms of the view of the media related to uh, the, the, uh, the violence behavior and to see whether we can further uh, to have a more sophisticated aspect or view about the how the social information bias is because that it, it can be used to explain the high the correlation between the media exposure and then the risk of aggression behavior. So that's again like this is like again like the, the next step maybe several steps uh, after the first one. But these are the things that we can think about. But one thing I'm missing in my current project is that we haven't tried to uh, classify or divide, uh, distinguish the behavior, aggression behavior by their type. Because we can see that, well, for aggression behavior, at least there are two primary, there are two types, right? Predatory aggression versus reactive aggression. Are uh, they the same in terms of their biological basis or their psychological construct? So, this is what we have known so far based on the two recent study. Well, the upper panel showed that the uh, the German studies, they, they, they try to, it's, it's a bit interesting study, they, tell, they divide that subject into three groups, three control groups, and then they tell a story about, about homicide in a different way. So the first group is that they define it as the appetite, appetite group, like we are trying to tell a story of the criminal, from the criminal's perspective. So like you, try, you can try to you know, encourage the subject to, to empathize with the, with the, with the perpetrator. And the second group is again is reactive, so we are focused on the perspective of the victim. And the third group is very neutral, just like doing a news report. So we found that if you give these three subjects, the, the subject to listen to a story in different, from different perspective, you can see they have different brain activation region. And so for, for example, at least if you compare the appetitive versus reactive, like the brain activation in the parietal role, single player role, like it's more act activated in appetitive type of subject. And, and it happened to that region happened to be visual information processing. So to make a long story short that when we try to conduct this research on the visual information processing, we might need to take the type of aggressive behavior into account. If we mix it together, actually you know, we might kind of uh, you know, minimize the signal. And the second, type, second study that published last year 
was the entire study to look at see, this, to see that whether the genetic signal were different between the advertitive and the reactive aggressive behavior. So with this prior evidence uh, being published, I think that the, the next step to try to either to replicate or extend the three type, three type of project that I mentioned, at least for the biological and psychological construct, that we might need to uh, uh, divide the, the behavior into the uh, you know, appetitive or reactive uh, aggression. So that's that. And this is the, I'm not sure this slide, right? Trying to see that the one of the examples that we can, can we combine this kind of different component together so we will be able to see that we need to take the diagnosis of the person into consideration and then we measure their, uh, the, the information processing. And then we, uh, um, we can assume that this visual in information processing can influence both the brain activation and the final behavior. And then always have to have a biological basis vector as a basis to, to measure that whether this directly influenced that or just uh, uh, becoming a, a confounder. And so I'm going to stop my presentation right here. And uh, I really appreciate your attention and your time. And if you have any question, uh, I will be trying my best to answer that. Thank you. Wondering for the sec second part of the study, what uh, do the, this patient do, do? This subject has a diagnosis. Um, during your, for your in your analysis, has the like ASD trait been be controlled? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a excellent question because I, I, I probably I didn't mention that we are currently conducting a study focusing on the high functioning uh, autism individual. But for that study, we just published, actually, we only recruited the, the young adults uh, from the community. Actually, it's based on voluntary recruitment. And so we used the questionnaire to ask them, do you have the major psychiatric diagnosis? And we, but because I think the community-based recruitment, so the number of the individual with psychiatric diagnosis is not very high, so we found that the results remain the same by is including or excluding those individuals without a psychiatric diagnosis. But I would say that well, if the if the proportion is is higher than what we had, maybe the result will be different, which means that that it's my we may need to at least con use control for that variable in the in our prediction model, like whether the di diagnosis can predict the result. But I guess the, the reason you're asking about autism is because uh, we found that can we see that the, the kind of avoiding eye contact is uh, you know, a biomarker associated with the, with the behavior that we don't know? And of course, that we can say that either like uh, you know, for individual with the more higher aggression tendency, they might try to, they, they are more sensitive to the cue with the aggression. So they subconsciously try to uh, you know, stay away from that because they know that they, they understand the meaning of that. So it's not, Maybe that, that would be different psychological mechanism in terms of like, is it, because I think you know that, in other words, child psychiatrists, you know that the kids, the individuals with autism spectrum deserve to be a higher, with higher risk of aggression behavior. So, I mean, if you say, if you include the two subjects of the kids, uh, normally developing kids versus the autism kids, definitely you will have this higher aggression group versus low aggression group. And then what you've observed is that, of course, these, these kids are group, the, 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 these kids will really have a, Avoid, have high level likelihood of avoiding eye contact compared to the other group. But hopefully that's not the case in our study because we, we actually in our, uh, in our that, that first sample, we, no one said that they have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Um, very interesting. A couple of questions. So the first one is about the inflammatory association with, with the aggression levels. And um, so the, the reason I was asking about what, what direction the inflammation goes is that there's a lot of research to suggest that higher inflammation is related to more depressive symptoms, more anhedonia, and kind of and, and decreased motivation, all of which seem to be kind of antithetical to aggression, right? right, right. So they're very much like sort of negative symptoms as opposed to, you know, sort of avoidance instead of approaching. So um, could you say a little bit about, I mean, so you did mention that maybe these 
associations have to do with kind of um, longstanding effects of stress. Um, but is there anything, any way that you could look to see whether there's a, re a reaction of gene expression or a reaction of inflammation to aggressive behaviors and, um, mm -hmm. you know, that has a causal link there? Because I would expect the opposite, that, that, the, that aggression would be related, that, that inflammation would be related to more passivity. Right, right. Well, um, well I mean, that's a very interesting question because it's really hard to tease apart. Uh, well, I would think that the idea of study we're, try, we're trying to look at like core, like uh, at least look at the the, the from long term perspective. Again, like a person may get depressed first, and then you, sometimes for some 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 patient, they initially they will kind of exhibit like a symptom of agitation, but then after medication, medication effects are another thing that we haven't talked about yet. Medication might kind of like. You know, when we see that depressed person with like a low level of, of uh, inflammatory responses, is it because of medication effect? We don't know. With some anesthetic, have a kind of anti-inflammatory effect. But if we can really tease apart to show that this can die, in fact, we will be able to really see that. Is there a, like a cascade? A like person get depressed and more sensitive to stress. And then the hypersensitive stress will lead to the uh, maybe elevated level of uh, pro-inflammatory responses. But then the pro-inflammatory response eventually they were kind of a, I'm mean, putting it in terms like they were, you, you were kind of exhaust those resources and then the inflammatory responses or you measure gene expression level it might go down maybe after the treatment or after a while when it becomes a chronic situation. So I think the main long story short is that I would suggest, I would speculate that that the result will be different when we compare chronic versus acute situation. And also that what we observe here actually is more laboratory. We try to manipulate the situation. Like these kids come in, suppose they are all calm after they are treated and medicated. And we try to elicit their very acute situation, getting frustrated. And so it's like, it's, it's, I think you know that they are chronic patients, they are bipolar disorder. Adolescents with bipolar disorder, so they'll be treated for a couple of years. And now, some people, when they feel frustration, some people have different brain activation or different gene expression level. Maybe they cannot be used to explain that's uh, the original behavior because it's more like that. We, we have a we have an artificial we have, we have the uh, manipulative uh, situation that doesn't really reflect what's going on in the in the real situation. So uh, so I think that for me that it will be really intri intriguing to see that can we look at the gene expression profile in different stages, baseline, after task, long term expert task, something like that. Maybe when I will have more common than saying that what the whole picture may look like. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, another thought I had is, uh, could you put the picture back up, the heat map of the two, the kid that was sort of had his arm out and. Yes. This one. Yeah, that one. So I wondered for the people with high aggression score. Um, I mean, maybe for the front kid, you could argue that they're avoiding eye contact, but but actually, the low aggression people look like they're looking more at their mouth <laughs> than their eye, right? Right. Um, but for the high aggression, they're looking at the arm. Right. Right. So I'm not sure that they're avoiding the eyes as much as they're looking at the action. And right. Maybe they're drawn to to thinking about the physicality of this situation, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to sort of the emotionality of it, or sort of, you know, it's like, that's the threat, the threatening part of this picture, I guess, is the, is the pointing, throwing, whatever he's doing, right, and so that's what they're drawn to, as opposed to avoiding the eye, I don't, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, but I think that's an excellent point, because uh, I remember which, when we tried to uh, dispute it with the reviewer, that we have, that we have different theory behind, behind that, well, I would say that eye contact, if we try to tap into the, the outer inspection disorder, it probably really is, is a hard sell because, you know, it's, we don't know whether this can really indicate that avoid eye contact. But what you point out is that looking at the region versus that, what does it really mean? We, the reason we use the, uh, the, the facial expression as uh, fa facial area as an area of interest is because uh, prior research has been showing that this is the most common area when we look at another person in a normal uh, social context. Uh, it's like a T area, and two eye and a nose and a mouse. So we use that as a, so like this is how they do it. Even might be shipping a little bit to mouse, but it's 
still maintaining the T area. And what does this mean? It might indicate, as you said, that a person has a higher aversion tendency, it will pay attention to like this. And when a person, like in a normal social context in a situation, if I raise my hand, it might indicate something, right? I mean, for a person who is more sensitive to the aggressive behavior in a scenario like this, is something that we need to be aware of, in addition to just the facial expression. So that is definitely that. So I think to, to clarify this situation, that the next more sophisticated study that we have to do is to try to uh, divide this into two different different support and to understand whether whether like, what gesture is what does gesture mean in, uh, in 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 people with different level of aggression. Yeah. And then finally, on the really interesting finding about this idea of you know, more media exposure explaining why there's uh, less and less time in between mass shooting events, obviously very relevant um, <laughs> right now. Um, it, it's, it strikes me though there that a big factor is kind of how do you react to those things because um, because you could imagine that there's a whole lot of people who who react to greater media exposure with more and more anxiety so that's mean, meaning maybe less and less likely to be aggressive so what the the question is are there a subset of people and i think you kind of alluded to this with this idea of looking at both individual and social are there a subset of people that when they hear these media that that promotes for them right. this idea oh i could get famous or oh this is something that you know, I'm uh, now I'm ready to do this because mm -hmm. you know again this sort of contagion effect, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like creating a society that's more and more anxious about mm -hmm. things <laughs> happening. Right. right. So who are the people that are going to respond to increasing media reports with a desire to go out and do more violence versus those that are just going to have a, like want to hide in their room? <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So I, I, I like this, this comment because uh, I think it's go back to my original idea that the, the very important question in clinical medicine or psychiatry or other specialties that the heterogeneity is very important aspect. We need to look at that carefully. So to put that in, to, to put that in written, the situation you describe it is that there might be two, at least two different types of individual in terms of how they react to the media coverage on mass shooting. For most uh, lower aggression risk of individual, they, as you say, when you feel more anxious, you know, try to you know, stay home more often. And it will be hard to think that, oh, because I watched so many um, you know, the media about this mass shooting, so I'm so angry, so I want to go there to do some action. It might not be applied to the more, the majority of individual, but as you know, that these the criminal, uh, these perpetrators, they usually they are a um, small group of the individual, maybe their personality profile and their other aspect of mental health. So these people they might react to these media differently from others, and especially one thing that we can quantify is that because when we we won't quantify the, the online report, but if we we can quantify the their social media behavior. We might see different things like I mean, they, are, they, they have they have a lot of Facebook Facebook or Twitter group, and you know, like-minded people they talk about their thing, they share their belief, and then they kind of encourage each other behavior. So they might interpret the result differently. Another interesting thing is that last year the, the mass shooting in the high school in Florida, I think, the, that uh, that perpetrator actually became kind of like uh, famous among some young people because he received some letters. When he was in the jail, and so, and so you'd be hard to say that. Uh, I mean, you, what 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 is going on there is because like he, he kind of he became a, kind of like a hero, of, you know, like a dark hero or something like that. And so, but I I, I would say that to, for us the researcher to understand the differences is that can we profile the subject differently and to observe okay this type of people may respond to that in this way and the second type of another way etc. So there might be another important research question. Thank you very much. Thank you.